do this and you're dead. I'm already dead. You gotta go. That man escaped your plantation and single-handedly killed three of men. I ain't trying to bring you down. Real. You might as well give up now. He's smart. They say he's African royalty. They call him Emperor. If you can't take the heat, don't light the fuse. You know why they call me Emperor? Because my granddaddy was a king. In me, I trust, yeah. You're not just your slave anymore. You're a symbol. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Mark. How are you? Greetings from Las Vegas. Yeah, thank you. How is things in Las Vegas? I can't believe it. It's, uh... Uh, it's been better, but right now it's not too good. You know, still, so, very, still very quiet. Huh? Yeah, still very quiet. I'm a native, so it's sad to see my city like this. But you know, when you're based on tourism and you got a pandemic, mm -hmm. you just have to just stick it out one day at a time. Um, I have to tell you, you know, when I graduated from high school in 1985, uh, I was an entrepreneur and I started my first video store. And by 1991, I had five of them. And then Blockbuster was coming to town. So I sold them and I went back to film school at UNLV. But to meet the man who started Trimark Studios, I am just so thrilled to meet you as a movie buff because your titles were always so popular in my video store. So I just wanted yeah. to say, you know, uh, it's a thrill to meet you. That, it's a thrill to meet you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did meet a lot of video store owners. And by the way, just a little thing, I started a video store owner myself. A couple of my friends were starting, uh, just opened one video store in Los Angeles, asked me if I wanted to be a partner with them. because I did say yes. Not because I thought it was a great business, which turned out to be, because I just figured I get to watch all the movies I want without having to pay rent. Yes. And as it turned out, they were really smart business people and grew. And then eventually, I decided to start my own video distribution company. So. Well, well thrilled to meet you. Uh, let's talk about Emperor. At the very beginning of the movie, there's that quote by uh, Abraham Lincoln. And right away, before the, even his name came up, uh, I recognized it because Walt Disney used that in the final moments of great moments with Mr. Lincoln at Disneyland. I had that album. I was a big president's kid, a fanatic when I was a kid. So when I saw that quote, that really set the tone uh, for emperor. So I thought that was really interesting to use that Lincoln quote. So, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, now emperor, you know, is inspired by the legend of shields, uh, Shields Green, uh, a descendant of African kings turned outlaw. I'm a history buff, and I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of Shields. Well, you're not the only one. Uh, we did a lot of research. I was, I'm a history buff myself. That's why I did this movie. People asked me, why did you do this? And I was really fascinated by American history, especially the Civil War area and slavery. And, uh, I, was, I was an immig immigrant, I came here when I was 17, and I didn't realize until I got here and studied the, the, what the scale of the slavery was. I thought it was just a few slaves here and there. I didn't realize it was such a huge commercial enterprise. So, uh, and you know, then I've seen the movies about, uh, you know, uh, slavery, most of them really well-made movies, well-directed, but they, most of them, that dealt with the injustice and the, uh, you know, misery of slavery, or a lot of them were about white saviors who come and save uh, good white people. Save. So, and I always wondered why isn't there a movie made about these slaves, like over 100,000 of them escaped, and a lot of them, 100,000 made it to freedom, more than that escaped and were killed. Uh, why doesn't make a movie about slaves actually fighting back? and succeeding. So as we were doing research, we came across several, and then I was also, I'm sure you know about the John Brown aspect of the story. I was really fascinated with John Brown. I thought he, he was such, I'm surprised he's not better known because what he did was really, really interesting and unique. It was so, Harper's Ferry, just a, it was just kind of a quick footnote, yeah. That's right, yeah, Harper's Ferry. And, and, and a lot of people, historians consider that the spark that, you know, started the, the fire of civil war. Uh, so, so as we were doing research, we were trying to find a basically a heroic set. And we just came, and in fact, the young person who was doing research for us, he came across someone and said, well, Mark, I think this is 
the world, and we read about Shields Green, it's very well, very little known. Uh, but there are little drawing pictures of him here and there. He, he was part of John Brown's posse. He did live on a plantation in South Carolina, and he did escape. He did have a five-year-old boy. Uh, so you figure this is the... And, and he, there was rumors that he's descendant of African royalty. Or some people thought because he has a certain attitude. Um, he, he was very proud. So that's really, um, you're not the only one. Most people have not heard of him. Hopefully after this movie, a lot more people will know him. And tell me about casting Shields Green and finding Deo uh, Kanihi, because uh, he was just amazing. But tell me about the journey and finding the right Shields Green. Yeah, we ended up uh, really auditioning because we figured we wanted somebody young to be close to his age. You know, Shields, when he ran away, he was 23 years old. Uh, so um, we wanted somebody young and, you know, being first time director, we couldn't get big stars. So we figured we're just going to go the best possible actor we can find. And uh, Dayo Okinei, he really, really, first of all, he loved the script. He called me personally several times. He came in for several auditions. We auditioned about, I would say, 20, 30 people over a two month period. And he just stood up, stood head and shoulders you know, above the rest of the people who were auditioning and figured, okay, give me, and his experience actor has been on other movies, big movies, TV series and everything, but this was going to be his, this was going to be his movie. And like, all I can say, he delivered this super smart, fantastic actor. And he contributed a lot to the you know, making of the film. And did you have any kind of, uh, putting cast and crew at ease, because it was a really difficult subject matter, let alone to watch, but being on set, uh, did you use any techniques to keep everyone, you know, we're looking at this movie with 21st century eyes when it's a 19th century story. Yeah, I think what we tried to do, and I think what, what we did from the outset told everyone, we don't want to make a movie focused on misery and justice, and the torture of slavery. If you notice, we try to minimize those aspects of it. We want this movie to be a heroic ride. And once we said that, people got it. So we, basically, this is about the guy who's fighting back uh, and succeeding. And that's what, uh, uh, that's what really got everybody cast and crew on board. And they, want, we, they knew we were, and they, we also wanted the movie to be beautifully shot, we chose beautiful locations because we wanted the, uh, we, you know, it's American South is gorgeous. It's like tropical, it's, it's just a lot of movies don't use those locations. We use all these practical locations. So I think this whole heroic ride um, or hero's journey thing, it really, really uh, spoke to everyone. I did notice that because uh, you concentrated more on the fantasy legendary element, which I thought was really positive, but it's not a documentary. So you had to make it entertaining. So you have a bank robbery, you have a posse, you had classic Western elements that, that not only, it, it was, it was, the, it was the, the legend of the hero. That's right. Well, I'm glad you picked up on that because I grew up, uh, when I was a kid, Westerns were our action movies. I saw all the John Wayne movies, I saw Sergio Leone movies. I grew up with Westerns, I still love Westerns. And so... Me too, but you got Bruce Dern in there, Mark. You know, he killed John Wayne. That's kind of bad <laughs> luck, you know? <laughs> so, so and, and the other thing, you're being a history buff, you know that if you look at Westerns and slavery were taking place at the same time, historically but nobody's ever married those two subjects together. So we thought, my idea was that it would be great if we can make a Western about slavery. And that was the idea, that we have the wagon chases and the battle scenes and even, even uh, you know, by the way, uh, Sergio Leone, Marconi type of inspired music in there and everything. So this is really a marriage of the two genres which, to my knowledge, well, you could say maybe uh, Django and Chain did it, uh, but that was pure. Uh, was sensationalism, yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's and it's, uh, it's pure. Let's call it pure Tarantino. 
Whereas this movie is based on historical facts. And, but why, by the way, one of the things people ask me is that you know, we've taken a lot of creative liberty in terms of storytelling and action, but in terms of the characters and actual historical events, it's very accurate. The dialogue that takes place between Frederick Douglass and John Brown is almost exactly like what happened in real history. The conversation between John Brown and Robert E. Lee, uh, the same thing. So, and the events that happen in terms of time and place are very accurate. So we stuck to the major historical, historical events and characters, but we took a lot of creative liberty in terms of the, um, uh, the details. Because I wanted to, that you picked up, I wanted to make a Western, basically. Well, they don't come any better than the legendary James Cromwell as John Brown. So uh, tell me about working with him because he's just brilliant in everything he does. Yeah, we got so lucky that uh, you got a call from our casting director that James Cromwell read the script and he wants to do it. The same thing is, uh, with uh, Bruce Stern, but James Cromwell especially, he, as it turns out, he's a history buff. He particularly knows and cares a lot about John Brown's story. So. He was not, in terms of acting, I mean, he's fantastic. You literally don't have to give him much direction. But in terms of uh, his knowledge of history, it was really helpful. And in fact, some of the dialogue that's in there, he actually came, uh, brought it to the table, said this is exactly what these guys talked about. So he was extremely, uh, you know, helpful and contributed a lot. And uh, I love towards the end of the film, you, what I call the die hard moment where he blows up the church and <laughs> he comes <laughs> flying out of the water. I just thought that was, I just love that, uh, how exciting that was. And, and yeah. also, uh, tell me about the snake across Deo. Was that a difficult scene for him? Because that freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was, yeah, actually, <laughs> it, it took a while to convince him to do it. It was, it was really a difficult scene. And uh, we wanted to have, re-emphasize that he's out in nature, it's not just thing, and he was, uh, and we did it, and it was, you know, it was, it was difficult to get the snake to do what we wanted to do, and, but finally we, we did it, but it was difficult, yeah. And two things, he had never ridden a horse before, he went three, through three months of horseback riding, training, and then he'd never been anywhere near a snake before. Well, Mark, congratulations on an inspirational film. And I know Reginald Hudland, you're in good company with him too. And uh, I think this is an important film and uh, a total pleasure in speaking to you today. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Talk again soon. Take care. Okay.